born, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't create Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Welcome, Word of Love Church family. It's so good to be able to come to you and share again today the Word of God and dig into the Word of God. If this is your first time joining us um, to our church service virtually, welcome as well. We're so excited and glad to have you. You know, at Word of Love Church, our vision is to love people into their kingdom purpose, and our mission is to equip all of God's children to have dominion in every area of their lives. And we do that by digging into the Word of God and pulling out those spiritual truths and applying them to our lives so that we can have this victory in Christ. So thank you for joining us and let's dig into the Word of God. Today we're continuing our study in the series Victory Alive in Christ. We are no longer dead in sin in the old nature of Adam, but we have become alive and in Christ, 
that gives us the victory over every situation in our lives. So today I want to uh, pick up in Romans chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me in the, to the book of Romans chapter 8. And we're going to read down to about verse, verse 8. So Romans 8, starting at verse 1. So here we go. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son, Jesus, in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. How many of you need life and peace in your life today? Amen. I know I need some. I can take, take some life and peace. Verse seven, because the carnal mind is enmity or an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. This is my focus verse today. Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The title of my message in, in this series is Pleasing God. Are you pleasing God? I've got one question for you today, and this is focused primarily for believers. This message today is, is really for those of you that have ex accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You are in Christ. You may have been a Christian one day, one hour, one second or 99 years, but you are in Christ, you are in the family, and I want to ask you today, are you pleasing God in your life? Is your lifestyle a lifestyle that pleases God? If God were to look down, and he is looking down, if God were to look down, would he just be able to say, yep, there goes my son, looks just like his brother Jesus, there goes my daughter, Reminds me of Jesus. Praise God. What a blessing to my heart. What, what, what a joy that their lifestyle brings to me. You know, in Romans 6 and 14, it says that we're no longer under this law covenant. We're under a grace covenant. It's a new covenant, a new agreement. It's not an agreement with God the Father based on our performance. It's an agreement with God the Father based on everything that Jesus Christ has done. And everything that Jesus Christ has done, everything that Jesus Christ has obtain through dying on a cross for us is ours all by faith. We just receive it by faith and it now becomes ours as believers in Christ. And so even though we're under this covenant of grace, guess what? We can still not be pleasing to God. And so my question again to you today, believers in Christ, those of us that claim to be uh, Christians or disciples or believers, whatever you call yourself, you're in the family of Christ. Galatians 4 and 7 says that when we come into Christ, we're no longer slaves and servants, but we're children of the Most High God. But are we pleasing Him? You know, it's just like a parent and a child relationship. You know, you, you can love your child and unconditionally love your child, not based on what they do or not do. You, you just love them because they're your, your children. But your children can be pleasing to you or not pleasing to you. You still love them unconditionally. That doesn't change that position. You don't kick them out of the house uh, when they do something, uh, don't make up the bed or don't wash the dishes. You don't kick them out of the house. They're still your children. No matter what you do or don't do, they're still your children. Children, But they can be pleasing to you or they can not be pleasing to you. They may not even be in your house because of something they may have done, a lifestyle that they may have chosen, but that doesn't change that they're your children. And so it's the same thing with God and us. When we came into Christ, when we came into his kingdom, into his family, we are 
in Christ. We are alive. We are supposed to live a victorious life. But we could be not pleasing to God. Amen. You know, it's, it's a, such a blessing for us when uh, our children, uh, they, if they're five and four and we, you know, tell them to do different tasks and we ask them to do different things, make up your bed and pick up your toys and do these things that, you know, represent a good household and doesn't hurt or break my ankles when I walk over all of the toys on the floor. And, you know, it's such a blessing to us when we don't have to tell them or ask them to do something like make up their beds, but they actually do it and choose to do it by themselves out of their own unction. They go and clean up their toys and pick up the food after themselves. That's pleases us as parents. I know it pleases me as a parent. When my child obeys without me having to demand and tell them to go do this, go do that, they just do it. That pleases me. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity as children of God to let our lives demonstrate. We have free will. We have a free choice to let our lives demonstrate the choosing to please God, to, to choose actions that please God. And we can let our lives be a sweet aroma that transcends up into heaven based on what we do here on earth. So the title of my message today for believers in Christ is, are you pleasing God? You know, the Bible says that we're no longer affected by sin. We, and and that's, that's true. There's, there's no way God the Father can judge us for our sins, the sinful acts that we do. And the reason for that is, completely wrapped up in what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's taken all of our sins, past, present, future. He's taken those all up and took them in on his body and God judged him for those sins on the cross. And when he said it is finished, he meant everything is finished. Everything has been paid for. We can no longer be judged by God, the Father, for any sinful acts that we do. But that doesn't necessarily mean that because we're under this grace covenant, we can just live a lifestyle that we want to live and not be pleasing to God. You can still be under this grace covenant and not be pleasing to God. That's amazing to me because over, you know, I studied this over 14 years ago and, you know, it always blew my mind when I would drive on the freeway and, and someone would cut me off and, you know, I'd see a bumper sticker on them on their car that, that just cut me off and screaming at me and laying on the horn for whatever reason and sticking up all kind of fingers and stuff like that. And then the bumper sticker, it says, follow me over to blah, blah, blah church. <laughs> or it's got one of the little fish on the back of the car. I'm thinking, what in the world? I'm a born again believer. Aren't you excited to be in the kingdom of God, to be victorious? What kind of action is that? How many of you know a uh, a Christian that's been a Christian for 65, 75 years and, and uh, is a, it got a little bit of a cussing spirit. <laughs> Every now and again, a little cuss word flies out. You know, Peter, <laughs> Peter had a problem of, of cussing and swearing. But how many of you know a, a cussing Christian or a gossiping Christian or a, um, a Christian that, that doesn't necessarily display a messy Christian? How many of you know some messy Christians? <laughs> I hope you're not... Uh, uh, turning the message off too quickly, but hang in there with me. I'm going somewhere with this, but I want you to think about how we can be pleasing to God. We can be pleasing to God. And, and like it says there in, in verse eight, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. When we live in the flesh, I'll explain to you what that means here. We cannot be pleasing to God. And if you have a desire, you've got to have a desire and a want to to please God. You, just like my kids, if they, have, they have to want to have a desire to please their parents and to be pleasing, not to get something, but just to be pleasing, just to be a joy, just to be a blessing. You've got a desire to please God. And so I, I looked in the Bible for a few characters that please God, and there were many of them that pleased God, but one that stuck, stuck, stuck out to me in particular was um, Enoch. Enoch. Enoch stood out to me in particular as pleasing God. And I want to turn really quickly, really quickly to the book of Hebrews, 
because if, there's very few places that um, Enoch is mentioned in the Bible, but I want us to just look at the few places that he is actually mentioned and see what he did to be pleasing to God. Because if you've got a yearning and a desire to be pleasing to God, we need to know how do we do this? How do we practically, again, how do we take the truth from the Word of God, apply it to our lives and situations, regardless of where we live or a country that we're in, these truths apply on earth and in heaven. But how do we apply them to our lives in a practical manner that you can understand? That's what I'm going to um, try to explain to you today so that you can apply this to your life. But Enoch in Hebrews 11, verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Couldn't find Enoch. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch had a testimony that he pleased God. What is your testimony out in the workplace, out in the marketplace, if, in your neighborhood? What is the testimony that you bring to the table? What do people say about you? So if I were to go out and ask someone about you as a Christian, as a born again believer, what about Curvin? What, what, what do you think about him? What, what about that guy? What do you, Oh, he's, he's got a little weird accent. What, is he or he's supposed to proclaims to be a Christian? What do you think about him? What's give me the rundown on Curvin? <laughs> well, you know, would that testimony be pleasing to God? Or would that testimony be not pleasing to God? Remember now, if it's not pleasing, that doesn't mind, mean that I'm not under his grace. That doesn't mean that I'm not under his covenant. It just means that I'm in his covenant, I'm in his house, but I'm not acting like one of his children should act. And so Enoch had this testimony that he was pleasing to God. If you turn with me to the book of Genesis really quick, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I just want to show you the, the testimony of Enoch and how did he actually get this testimony to see if we can have this same testimony in our lives as well. So in Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, it says here that Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Why would he name his son that? But anyways, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So that all the days of Enoch were 365 years. He lived to be 365 years old. But watch this in verse 24, it says, And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, this is when God took him away. He was not because God took him. So we can learn here from Enoch a quick tip on how we can be pleasing to God. A way that we can be pleasing to God is we walk continually with God. We walk continually with God. He walked with God. You know, he had a family. He had children. He had baseball games and soccer games and whatever they played back in the day. Um, they lived a long time, so I'm sure they found some recreational things to do and go on the lake and go on the boat and do things and, and do stuff. We, we do stuff, but do we put God first? Or do we put the stuff first? Do we put all the activities first and the things that we need to go do first and, the, and I got to take my kids here and I got to take my kids there and I got to do this for my kids and I got to work hard so my kids could have a good future and a good life and... We never spend time with God because all of the time gets used up. Enoch, in order to please God, he walked with God. What does that mean? He just touches in and talks with God. He spends time with God in prayer and just fellowshipping with God, building that relationship with God. And God just got to a point one day where he said, look, man, I'm so pleased with you. It's closer to my house than your house. Just come back and go with me. Praise God. So God just took him up and he went up to heaven. Isn't that amazing? You know, I want to be so pleasing to God. I want to demonstrate and exhibit a life that's so pleasing to God that it's a sweet-smelling aroma. That he just is looking down and saying, well done, son. That's, that's how we ought to act. It, you know, it doesn't change, again, the blessings and the provision that he provides for my life. But it just gives me joy to know that I can please God. I can actually move the heart of God and... and and please him. Give him joy. Uh, make him proud. Just like our children can make us proud by some of the things that they do. Anyway, that's, uh, 
that's 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 just such a blessing to be able to do that but how do we practically do this you know how do we practically do this because you can have christians that you know do certain things and say certain things and act a certain way and you're just wondering uh, that's not what jesus would do that's not what a child of god should be doing and so how do we practically correct this how do we teach someone the correct way that we should do these things and romans 7 the apostle paul is going through a period in time where he's facing this struggle and this battle and he's so inter perspective inter perspective he's thinking about i think personal pronouns are used about 20 times in chapter 7 to describe paul and what he's doing he's saying i i the good that i wish to do i can't do and the Verse 19 in chapter 7 says, For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice is very I-centered and me-centered. And, and within ourselves, we don't have the strength to walk out this Christian life. So don't feel judged. Don't feel condemned. We don't have the strength within ourselves. This is why God gives us a helper. God gives us the Holy Spirit to be the power behind us to help us live out this Christian life. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't lose because we have help. It's not within ourselves that we can walk up this Christian life. God has given us the power of his Holy Spirit on the inside of us to help us walk out this Christian life, to help and guide us so that we can be pleasing to God. But I want to go back to verse 5 because that's easier said than done. It says it sounds very spiritual. Oh yeah, I got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to help me walk out this life and but how do you really do that? Like how do you practically Use the Holy Spirit or tap into the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that's pleasing to God. Well, I want to point you back then to answer that question to verse 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Follow me. The scripture says here that for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And so there's two things that we can do practically to please God. The first thing, if you're not a believer and you, you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anybody that comes to God must first believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So as a non-believer, the first thing that we have to do is accept Jesus Christ, come into the family of God. That's all done by faith. You know, you're not needing to get cleaned up and work on this and get holy and get super spiritual. You just need to come as you are in your sin, in your brokenness. We're all broken in some degree, in some area. And so you can't wait to get fixed to come to Jesus Christ. You can come to Jesus Christ just as you are. It's just a decision that you make. You receive him by faith and you're into the kingdom of God. So the first practical step as a non-believer that we can do to please God is just to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But then the next step, and this is really my focus today and the people that I'm talking to today are my brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ. You could have been in Christ for one hour or you could have been in Christ for 99 years. You, I'm speaking to you today. The Lord put it on my heart to, to really speak to his children, to speak to us that are in the body of Christ and have us to ask the question, uh, are you pleasing God? Are you pleasing daddy? Is daddy happy with you? Is daddy happy with your lifestyle? If he would have looked down and, 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 and just take a sneak peek in at you, and he's looking all of the time, he's omni, omnipresent, but is, are, is your life pleasing to him? And and so the second thing that we could do is live a lifestyle empowered by the Holy Spirit to please God. And when we have this Holy Spirit, if we don't put, it's having the Holy Spirit and trying to accomplish this pleasing God is kind of like having a big engine in a car in your garage, but there's no gas in the tank. So we get born again, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of us, but we're not demonstrating a victorious life in Christ. It's just like a car engine that's souped up and it's got all the horsepower in the world and it can do all of the things that we needed to do and perform the way we want it to perform, but it's got no gas in the tank. 
Well, in 1 Peter 2 and 2, it, the Bible says that we are to turn, turn there with me really quickly. I'm going to do this really quickly. But in 1 Peter 2, it says that we are to desire, desire, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, well, I'm going to go to verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says, Therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. How many of you know some Christian believers that do that type of stuff? Verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Indeed, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You've tasted that the Lord is gracious to you. You've tasted the, the good news about Christ. Now we need to put some gas in the tank. Now we need to take the word of God. He's saying to take the sincere milk, the purity of the word of God, put it into your hearts, connect it with the Holy Spirit, and now you've got an engine with gas that can run so that you can be pleasing to God. Amen. So this pleasing God isn't done in your own self-will, in your own ability. It's done through and by the assistance of the Holy Spirit and you putting the word of God in your heart, in the tank of the Holy Spirit, so that then you can do the things that would be pleasing unto God. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to zone back into Romans 8 verse 5, because this is the practical step of how we do this. It says again, I'll read it one more time. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So here's what this means. Very important. I want to, uh, let me institute another statement here or another truth. Thoughts turn into words. Words then turn into actions. Actions repeatedly done turn into habits that form our character. Our character is represented by our lives, our livelihoods, what people see, what God sees, things that are going to be pleasing to Him or not pleasing to Him. They start from our thoughts. And so the Bible says there that to live according to the flesh we set our minds first on things of the flesh. To live according to the Spirit, we have to set our minds on things of the Spirit. Here's what that means. Let me break that down for you a little bit more. Jesus said in John 6 and 63 that the words that I speak to you, those are spirit and those are life. So what God is saying here is that if we go along that vein of my words become or my thoughts become my words my words become my actions my actions become my habits my habits become my character my character becomes my lifestyle if that's the workflow and the pattern then i need to set my thoughts this is setting our minds remember that we're made up of three parts spirit you are a spirit soul you have a soul that's your mind and then your body, all of that lives in a body, a physical body, this body that you can see. But I am, Kervin is a spirit. Kervin isn't this person that you see in this body. Kervin at the heart of who he is is a spirit. This is just my earth suit that my spirit and my mind live in. And so we have to renew our minds then to God's word because it says that if we wanna live in the spirit, then I have to set my mind on the things of the spirit. What are the things of the Spirit? The things of the Spirit are just like what Jesus said, His Word. His Word is Spirit. His Word is truth. So if I set my mind, if I set my thoughts on God's words, then my words are going to come out of those thoughts. Then my actions are going to come out of those actions. Then my character is going to be formed from the root of the words that I got from God's Word. Now, on the contrary, if I set my mind on things of the flesh, like it says here in verse 
5. If I set my mind on things of the flesh, guess what? The same law applies. That's right. If I get fleshy words, carnal words, they're going to turn into carnal actions. And those carnal actions, if I do those over and over and over and over again, guess what? My character is then going to be formed by those carnal thoughts, those carnal actions. And so now my mind has been set based on thoughts of the flesh, as opposed to thoughts from the Spirit of God and His world. So guess what? Which one is going to be more pleasing to God? Thoughts based in the flesh or thoughts based in the Spirit? And let me, let me help you out to make it real easy. I need things to be as simple as possible. Let me help you out with this. Everything in this life pertains to God's Word is Spirit. He is the one that created this universe. He created the world. This Bible is His instruction manual for how His creation should operate in this world. Anyone else that tells you any thought or any word that's outside of God's Word, you could call it flesh. Call it another man. Call it another opinion. Call it someone else. But if it's not God's Word, it's in this category of the flesh. So if your mama, your daddy, your cousin, your best friend, your auntie, your uncle, your, uh, the guy on the side of the road, for whatever reason, if you want to believe him, your best friend, I don't care how much you love them, I don't care how much you like them, if their words that they're telling you and their thoughts that they're telling you aren't from the Word of God, they're not spirit and they're not truth. So you're living in the flesh. And guess what? If you take those fleshy words and thoughts, you're going to do those fleshy words and thoughts. This is critical, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking specifically to believers in Christ. If we want to be pleasing to God, then what do we have to do? We need to take those thoughts. Romans 12 and 2 says that. Don't be conformed to this world. We've got an enemy. We've got the world, the, the devil, and the flesh. All of those are infiltrated through one channel. That's our minds, our mindset. This is why the battlefield is in our minds, because that is where the enemy attacks us with different thoughts. This is why we have to be careful with who we hang around and who we listen to all of the time. The news reporters and the, uh, the Facebook post and the Instagram post and the social media post. We've got to be careful of who we're listening to and who we are reading and who we are sharing. Why? Because the more you, you listen and you read and you look at and you watch those thoughts that are fleshy thoughts and they don't line up with the Word of God and they're not spirit, guess what? You're going to start to do and be those thoughts. Your character is going to form those thought, thoughts. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we can have Christians that uh, practice injustices. We can have Christians that continually and habitually sin and never change and never renew their minds to what God has to say about that particular situation and, and Christians that say it's okay to do this thing over here that God doesn't really agree with because the culture, the world, remember our enemy is the world, this world that has set a mindset outside of God's world and His rules and His regulations. And if this world has set that up and we start to believe it and we start to watch all of the commercials that perpetuate it and advertise it, guess what? You're now going to do what you thought about. This is why he says, in order to please God, set your mind on things in the Spirit. Set your mind on things in God's Word. Because when you set your mind on things of God's Word, you're going to do things of God's Word. When you do things of God's Word, you're going to be pleasing to God. See, this is only going to resonate with you <laughs> if you've got a desire to grow. If, you, if you're a 60, 60, you've been a Christian for 65 years and you're comfortable and think you've got it figured out and there's no more growth for you to have, this message isn't going to speak to you. This message isn't going to minister to you. But if you've been a Christian for 65 years and you've got some tendencies, some isms and some mindsets that don't necessarily line up with the Word of God, they're more a cultural mindset they're more a mindset affiliated with your political party. You know, if that mindset doesn't line up with the Word of God, you're called to a higher kingdom. You're in the flesh. 
You're living in a fleshly mindset. You're demonstrating a fleshly mindset, a carnal mindset is what it says here in verse 6. And in verse 6 it says that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we can't set our minds based on a certain thing with our uh, history has told us or our ancestry has told us if it doesn't line up with the word of God we need to change it we need to not conform to it the word conform means to take the shape or the the form of so if I have a container of water and I pour water in a circular container guess what the water is gonna form a circle so if I fill my mind with fleshly things guess what my life then the output is gonna represent the input so if I put fleshy inputs in there from Facebook and things that don't make sense and, and social media and, and the garbage that's out there, if I continually as a born again Christian, I'm still in the kingdom, I'm still in the house, God still loves me unconditionally, but he's not pleased with me. He's not pleased with my actions. He's not pleased with, with, with what I'm perpetuating, with what my life is demonstrating and, and, and what I look like. What if God were to do an audit of your Facebook account? Would he be pleased if God took all of your social media platforms, if God took all of your phone conversations that you're having with your friends? And these could be Christian friends. Oh yeah, you could have, you can be a Christian and be racist. Any ism, you can still be a Christian and have these isms. Why? Because it's fleshly thinking, fleshly seeds that have grown and grown over time and has been fed to be a fleshly mindset. So here's the good news. I got good news for you today. You can change those mindsets, praise God. You can take the Word of God and lay it over those old mindsets. And listen, we all have them. None of us are perfect. We, we all have these different issues and, and uh, prejudices tucked down on the inside of us that we all need to resurrect and pull out and receive a full healing from God but it starts by taking his word, taking that sincere truth and holding it higher than what someone else said in the flesh. Because someone else's words in the flesh are basically, basically saying that they're God and they're smarter than God and I don't believe what God is saying because he's not that smart. I have an opinion. Listen, everyone else's opinion outside of God, let me tell you something, it's wrong. <laughs> Point blank. Make it easier for yourself. Don't try to differentiate and and, and, and divvy it up. It's wrong. It's a flesh mindset. It's not a spirit mindset. And you as a child of God, you have committed to Jesus being Lord over your life. You're in the kingdom of God. You need to set your mind on kingdom things, on spiritual things, on things that are above and not beneath, on love, on unity. Those are the things that God wants us to demonstrate. Praise God. I'll get off of my soapbox on that and, and, and keep moving along here. <laughs> but it's so true. This, ladies and gentlemen, this was so freeing and uh, encouraging for me to have hope. And not that, you know, I'm nobody to impress or, or need to be impressed. But I just want my brothers and sisters in Christ to represent Jesus. I just want... God to be proud of you, God to be proud of me, God to be pleased with you, God to be pleased with me by our own doing and our own choice. And the way that we have to do this is we have to set our minds on things of the Spirit. Amen? Praise God. Proverbs 23 and 7 says that as a man thinks in his heart, that word heart is the centrality of who we are as human beings. It is the mind. As you think in your mind, so are you. Again, it's our same process of here's how it works. The thoughts become words. The words become actions. The actions become habits. The habits become our character. The character is either going to be pleasing to God or not pleasing to God. So let's reverse engineer this. If my character isn't pleasing to God, if the things that I'm doing aren't pleasing to God, if what I'm demonstrating doesn't please God, what I can do is go in reverse. I can change my thoughts. If my output isn't pleasing God, I can change my thoughts. I can then change my words. 
I can then change my actions and my habits. And it's all by the help of the Holy Spirit. This isn't you and your ability in this process because we'll fail. We're not good enough. We're not smart enough. But the Holy Spirit can help us change our thoughts, our words, our actions and habits, and then our character changes. When our character changes, we become in a deeper relationship with God because we're pleasing Him. Remember, it's not about love. Unconditional love, that's a done deal. It's sealed and it's set. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Now we're talking about pleasing God, going deeper with God, not being a carnal Christian for 99 years, but being a spirit-filled filled Christian, a Christian that's walking in a life that's representing God, that's being a sweet-smelling aroma to God. That's got to be your desire. That's my desire for you. That's my desire for me to go to a higher level. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> you know, we, we then have to guard our hearts and our minds. We have to guard our minds. See, the culture would lead us to believe and lead our children to believe that being a Christian isn't cool. It's not a cool thing to be a Christian. It's not hip and it's not the, the, the happening thing to do. But, you know, we guard our hearts so that we can be pleasing to God. The world isn't going to direct you to do things that are pleasing to God. That doesn't mean that you're not cool. I think it's cool to be pleasing to God. I think it's cool to live a life that demonstrates Jesus Christ. That shows victory. Uh, people that may be living in the world in that worldly lifestyle, that fleshly lifestyle, they may appear to be happy, but they're not happy. They're going to produce fruit that they, they don't necessarily want. They're going to produce fleshy fruit. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. So we have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that we are of a kingdom. We are of a kingdom, of a higher level, of a higher authority. We want to be pleasing to God. We want to be uh, children of God. We want to be of allegiance to God over anything, over more than a, a political party affiliation, more than a, a division for whatever reason, more than a, a financial class, rich versus poor, black versus white. That doesn't, we don't want to set our minds on those different groups. We want to set our minds on spiritual things, things of Christ, things that would be pleasing to God. So I ask you to do this one thing. I want you to take the practical step and think about the words that you're speaking and the words that you're thinking. Think about the things that you're doing in your life. Would it be pleasing to God? Think about before you forward that message or send this text or post that thing. Think about this one question. Is it pleasing to God? Does it line up with what the Word of God says where it says to think about these things that are noble and, and pure? Do these things that are righteous. Does it do that? The words that you're saying, does it please God? The things that you're doing, does it please God? Ladies and gentlemen, we are called to a higher authority. We're called to a higher standard. We have help in the Holy Spirit to help us get there. But we have to want it. We've got to have the desire to want to please God. We have to have the boldness and the courage. And we can ask God for His grace to strengthen us in this, to have a desire for pleasing God. See, get rid of the mediocrity. We've got, we can't be mediocre Christians anymore. The world is groaning for Christians to take their stance in this place and, and their place in this world. Disciples, believers, whatever you call yourself. Children of God. The world is eagerly waiting and yearning for us to take our rightful place in this world and to set our minds on things of the Spirit so that we can be pleasing to God and helpful to one another. I want you to, to uh, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you search my heart, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, search my heart. Find those things on the inside of me that may not be pleasing to God. You know what they are, Holy Spirit. I pray that you bring them to light, bring them to my remembrance. Help me to be the Christian that I'm called to be. 
Help me to be the Christian that the Father expects me to be. Help me to be a child of God that he demonstrates in his house and in his kingdom that Jesus Christ has come onto this earth to demonstrate for us. Help us with that, Lord Jesus, we ask. We have a desire. And if we don't have the desire, Lord, we pray for a desire, Lord, a new yearning, a new burning in our hearts by the Spirit of God to be more pleasing to God. Not that that pleasing is going to earn us or get us anything, but just to be a blessing back to God for all that he has done in sending Jesus to die for us. We just want to send a little something back to him to show him our gratefulness, to show him our love for him, to show how we can be pleasing to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to read one more thing to you before I close here. I've already closed, but this will be my second closing. I just thought this was interesting. This was an interview that Mahatma Gandhi had with a gentleman, and the gentleman asked him, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming his follower? Gandhi replied, oh, I don't reject Christ. I love Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike Christ. Listen to that. I pray that speaks to your heart as a Christian, as a child of God, as a born again believer for however long you've been a born again believer. And I, I challenge you, I challenge you to, to look at your thoughts, look at the way you've been thinking, look at the way you live your life, look at what testimony your life is showing. Does it look like Enoch's life? Or does it look like just the life of, of another non-believer? You know, it's interesting enough, we've got st statistical data that shows the different areas and avenues of life in the world and things that they deal with and the statistics of the church. And we look pretty much the same. There's no differentiation. But I believe and I have hope that through the Holy Spirit, by renewing our minds to the Word of God, by loving each other, apart from our differences, the, apart from our political affiliations, apart from our skin color, that we can love each other in a kingdom way, in a Christ-like way, in a spirit-filled way, and we can then be the change that this world needs to see. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you. I pray that you hung in there with me. I know that was a lot to cover, but I pray that you hung in there with me and that this message was a blessing with you. Listen, this is quality message. This is quality word. This is quality truth. This is something noble. This is something righteous. We've got to spread these seeds, spread these words, spread these thoughts. I took them directly from the Word of God. I'm not that smart to come up with it. <laughs> I pulled it directly from the Word of God and I just shared it with you. I had the opportunity to share it with you and that's what I did. And now share those good seeds of spirit. Forget the flesh. Forget those old ways of thinking. Share this message with someone that you know. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you. I pray the Lord keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. I pray that the Lord give you favor over this next coming week. I pray that your children have favor, your children's children have favor on to generations and generations that we can't see today. They have favor. And I pray that the Lord grant you his shalom peace, that you be blessed in your mind, in your body, and in your emotions. You are a whole, complete, and a child of God. Let's be pleasing to him. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you, and you have a good week. Well, thank you for watching this message. I pray that it was a blessing to you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram so that you can continue to receive uplifting and encouraging messages just like this one. And join us every Saturday at 5 p.m. where we have our fellowship and worship services. And if you feel led to give and sow into this ministry so that we can continue to further the gospel of Jesus Christ, the information is shown below there on your screen where you can mail your giving in or do it online. Thanks again for watching and be blessed.